presents its great new 1952 model, the first car in the world with dual range performance. It's on display today at your nearest Pontiac dealer. And now your Pontiac dealer brings you the world news as edited and reported by John Daly. He has cleared the first great hurdle, Captain Kurt Carlson, of course. A radio message from the tug turmoil says it has succeeded in tying a line to the flying enterprise, and this should mean that Captain Carlson's gallant stand against the stormy Atlantic may be crowned with success, the success he so richly deserves. Earlier today, the tug got its first mate aboard the stricken ship that Captain Carlson has ridden alone for a week. And with the mate's help, Carlson was able to catch and make fast the hawser. Now it's only a matter of time until the turmoil will be towing Captain Carlson and his ship towards the coast of England, still 300 difficult miles away. And as this good news reaches us, seven members of the Enterprise's crew, whom Captain Carlson sent into lifeboats last Friday, arrive in New York by plane. These seven sailors are the first of the crew of 40 to get back to this country. The 10 passengers aboard the ship were all Europe bound when the storm crippled the flying Enterprise, so they did not return. And the other sailors are still in England. Coming off the plane, the seven sailors go into the airport administration building where they're confronted by a battery of microphones and have some things to say about their experience. My name is Harold Glaive. I was crew pantryman on the Flying Enterprise. When the ship took this lift, we all ran upstairs and the first person that jumped over the side of the ship was a woman passenger. She'd done that to prove to the rest of the passengers that she was no fear with inside of her to be saved right along with the rest. I see. How was the captain when you last saw him? What were his last words to you, for instance? The captain's last words were just before I jumped, he said, the boat's close enough now. Jump. God bless you. Uh, do you think he'll bring her safely into port? Yes, I do. How long did you spend in the water? Myself and the three, the three persons who came with me were in the water about 40 minutes. And I think Captain Carson is a great man for staying on the ship, and we all admire him. I hope I shall go back to the ship with him. And well may that seaman say, I hope I go back to the ship with a skipper like Captain Carlson, who has won the admiration of the entire seafaring world for the way in which he upheld the tradition of the sea. Even at Sailor's Snug Harbor on Staten Island, the old salts of windjammer days are in awe of his bravery. These sea captains are not loquacious men and their words are few, but the words they leave unspoken speak volumes on what they think of Captain Carlson. Well, rather. One I wouldn't want to be in. He's, well, he's doing what he's supposed to do, but he's away out of date, and I think he's foolish for it. Captain Carson is in a tough spot. Situation is a little old-fashioned. Following the tradition of the sea. As expected, the CIO Steelworkers Convention in Atlantic City today voted to postpone a strike against the United States Steel Corporation. The 3,000 delegates unanimously approved a recommendation by Philip Murray that they give the Wage Stabilization Board 45 days to act on their wage demands. We are doing this, Murray said, at the urgent bequest of the President. But Murray also said, we are not giving up our right to strike if we do not like what the wage board may recommend. As this strike threat was removed, however, another serious strike was spreading. CIO packing house workers by the thousands are walking out of Swift and Armour meat packing plants all over the country. And here in the great port of Norfolk, Virginia, the worst maritime tie-up since our own New York dock strike continues. With scores of ships tied up, railroads have embargoed all freight moving into the port. The strike was pulled by AFL tugboat men who walked off these snub-nosed little workhorses of the sea. The tugboat men want higher wages and a reduction in their work week from 48 to 40 hours. The worst effect of the strike has been to stop the shipment of millions of tons of coal badly needed in Europe. Without this American coal stymied at Norfolk, defense plants in Europe will have to stay closed. And out on the high seas, Winston Churchill is racing for New York in the Queen Mary. 
the seas and suggestions that his greeting here in the United States would not be warm, both abating. President Truman last night knocked down rumors that Washington was warming up a series of rebuffs for Mr. Churchill, and today Washington made it clear that Prime Minister Churchill can, for instance, get assurances when he reaches Washington that the United States will consult Britain before ordering any atomic bombing from our air bases in England. The Queen Mary broke all records in yesterday's run, and her officers promised that the Prime Minister will arrive here in New York Saturday morning in time to implane for Washington and once again drive up to Blair House for lunch, as he does in our film. On this previous visit, Mr. Churchill was a private citizen, was, as you can see, heartier, had lost less of his great energy to the years. On this visit to President Truman, he carries into Blair House the great burdens of his great office, held in as difficult times as his nation has known. Among the burdens to be discussed with his host, communist China, the crises in Iran and Egypt, and, of course, the future of Korea. Today's important developments concerning Korea took place not at Panmunjom, but in Paris and Washington. At the United Nations, Russia won Arab support for her proposal to take the Korean armistice question to the UN Security Council. But Secretary of State Acheson declared in Washington that such a move would be disastrous and announced that the United States will vote against it. Acheson said it would utterly destroy the progress already made at Panmunjom, where the truce teams meet again two hours from now to try to break the deadlock on prisoner exchange and the policing of the armistice. Earlier today, the Allies refused flatly to budge even an inch from their stand against the construction of enemy airfields during any armistice. And now, for your Pontiac dealer, here's George Ansborough with a word about something you may be missing. Yes, you're missing something if you've not yet driven the great new 52 Pontiac. You're missing the greatest advance in automatic driving since the automatic transmission itself. But what you see here is a dual range performer. A Pontiac that gives you the power you want, when you want it, where you want it, to master any driving situation. All you do is simply lift one finger to put your dual range Pontiac in traffic range. Pontiac's high compression engine responds with power to spare, quick, alert, eager. Then out on the highway, you simply flick into cruising range, fairly sailing over the miles with a hushed new smoothness that's almost like coasting. What's more, Pontiac delivers plenty of extra miles per tank full, real gas-saving economy that's built in to stay. Dual range performance is but one of the many wonderful features of the new 52 Pontiac. You can see its gleaming new silver streak beauty. Inside, there are luxurious new cover-matched interiors. And Pontiac is still one of America's lowest-priced cars. Just one easy step above the very lowest. Your Pontiac dealer will be glad to demonstrate. See him soon. One look, one ride will offer substantial proof that feature for feature and dollar for dollar, you can't beat a Pontiac. And now back to John Daly and the news. The hottest political question in Washington tonight is whether President Truman is getting ready to fire his old friend and Attorney General J. Howard McGrath. Several weeks ago, at the peak of the tax scandal, Mr. Truman made it clear that his promise of a drastic cleanup did not include a demand for McGrath's resignation, despite pressure from congressmen. But the situation seemed to have changed yesterday when Mr. Truman refused to discuss McGrath at his weekly news conference. McGrath himself kept answering no comment to queries put to his office throughout the day. He was still mum, as a matter of fact, and a little glum, too, when he arrived at the White House for a cabinet meeting today. McGrath emerged one hour and 35 minutes later in a jovial mood and told reporters that no change in his status was contemplated. Then he added the cryptic remark, things are not always what they seem on the surface. Washington remains unconvinced, however, that McGrath's job is safe, that he will be sitting at this desk if Mr. Truman decides to run for re-election this year. And McGrath himself conceded that the statement on his status was not authorized by the president. The White House, as a matter of fact, declines comment. The federal government cracked down hard today on dope peddlers all up and down and across the country. Narcotics agents have arrested more than 500 persons in by far the biggest roundup in history. Every big city in the nation is involved with 50 peddlers under arrest right here in the city of New York. The raids began late last night after months of investigation and continued throughout the day. The agents for the most part 
went after second and third offenders. And now people, places, and things. The government came up with some figures today to prove you and I are really not spending any more of our income on food today than we were five years ago. It sounds a little crazy, doesn't it? But the Agricultural Department explains it this way. Sure, food costs have gone up, but so has your income, the department says. And here on our animated chart, let's see what has happened. In 1946, the average American spent $292 each year to feed himself, 26% of his income after taxes. In 1947, his food bill rose to $329, 28% of his income. Last year, 1951, the average American spent $375 on food, but his income after taxes had risen to $1,442. So he was right back where he was in 1946, spending 26% of his income on food. Tonight, the government made another announcement about food prices that's good news. The food price index, it says, fell one and two tenths percent in the month ending December 15th. And now a proud mother, a hero son of Decatur, Alabama, have a day to long remember. The families of 13-year-old Nathan Tate and four-year-old Lowell Reese shake hands in true friendship as the 13-year-old scout is paid the honor due him for saving little Lowell's life at the risk of his own. For pulling the youngster from the path of a speeding train, Nathan is awarded the Carnegie Foundation Medal. And young Lowell is just as happy about this award as Nathan is. Nathan has more coming. First of all, the high praise of his own buddies, spoken with a boost up on their shoulders, and then the reward to fill the heart of any 13-year-old, especially a boy who lives near the tracks and wants someday to be an engineer. This is what Nathan really wanted. The Louisville and Nashville Railroad made a dream come true for an American boy hero in Alabama who made his people and his nation proud to have him in the family. G.I. Cheer Up, movie star Paul Douglas and his wife Jan Sterling arrive in Korea to entertain our troops. Jan gives the boys some songs, they give her a scarf. In return, Jan expresses her thanks quite warmly. He's a lucky boy. The G.I.s also let Jan fire a howitzer at the enemy not many miles away. She and Paul get into the line at the canteen with everybody else. They not only brought entertainment to the troops in Korea, but both of these Hollywood people gave blood while at the front, setting an example for all of us. Fifteen minutes after they finished one show, enemy artillery blasted the area, wounded one soldier, but the risk was worth hearing one G.I. say, seeing Jan Sterling was better than a three-day pass. Gold Star 4F. These Gold Star mothers in Chicago were stunned when one of their members, Mrs. Joe Willie Riley, was ordered to report for the draft. And then when the draft board classified her as 4F, they shared the indignation which she expressed. As you will hear her say, Mrs. Riley had other ideas about how she should have been classified. 22nd of December, I got a surprise of my life. I was expecting a letter from my sister, and when I opened it, it was a letter from my uncle, from my uncle Sam, and he wanted me to come into the service of the United States of America, so I am willing to go if I can be of any help. So I visited the Gold Star Mothers in Ms. Nielsen's home of American Nation, the American Gold Star Mothers, it was, and asked if any of those had been drafted in the Army. But I'm surprised to find they haven't. I would, don't mind going if I could have my other Gold Star Mothers to go along with me. But the paper states that I am in 4F, and that just makes me fighting mad. I don't like it. I can be a better soldier than that. <laughs> and that wraps up the world news for tonight. Good night. Remember, there's only one place you can know what dual range performance means at the wheel of a great new 1952 Pontiac. See it, drive it at your nearest Pontiac dealer. It's on display now. Your Pontiac dealer is proud of his new car and proud to bring you John Daly and the world news Monday through Friday. Dollar for dollar, you can't beat a Pontiac. The preceding program, originally telecast by ABC in New York, has come to you by special video recording. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.